Uh, this is the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM with me, Daniel Dazi. We're also live on the AM show on Joy News on Multi TV. We are live on Facebook. Joy 99.7 FM is the page, and on YouTube, my Joy Online TV. Our guest this morning is Second Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Mrs. Elsie Awaji. Good morning, Mrs. Awaji. Good morning, Daniel. Happy New Year. Hope all is well. Very happy New Year. And um, may I take this opportunity to wish all of your listeners an outstanding 2019. All right. We are already having a super 2019 over here. And it's been busy for you as well. Because this started way back in 2017. This shakeup in the banking sector, which we all reported of. The purchase and assumption of UT and capital banks by GCB. Um, the consolidation of some five other banks to form the Consolidated Bank Ghana. Uh, later, we heard stories of how it happened. We've seen persons being sued for monies. And the Bank of Ghana has still been busy. It happened with the 400 million CD minimum capital requirement uh, that was placed on all of the banks operating in Ghana. So now we have 23 banks, and 16 of which were home and dry. Some three measures had to go on. Five of these banks have gone through a Ghana amalgamated trust system. Today, we are here to break down and understand exactly what has happened. You know, one good way to understand any action is go to the people who took the action and get the rationale and the reasoning behind it. Armed with that knowledge, we can then go forward and look at how those actions will affect us going forward. That's exactly what we want to do this morning. Mrs. Awaji is here to explain to us and help us understand what exactly is going on. Mrs. Awaji, thanks so much uh, once again for joining us uh, this morning. Let's begin with Friday's announcements. Do they bring us to the end of the shakeup in the sector that began in 2017, or are we to expect more? Thank you, Daniel. So let me go back a little bit. You, you mentioned how um, 11 banks have exited and the fact that this all started with a 400 million minimum capital requirement mm. uh, increase. I'd like to explain this a little bit more because the cleanup really started because we had insolvent banks. As far back as 2015, a very detailed asset quality review of the banking sector had been carried out by the Bank of Ghana itself. This exercise was repeated in 2016, and it was very clear that as far back then, there were about nine banks that were insolvent, deeply insolvent, I might add. Now, these banks were, it turned out, given opportunities to recover from their distress. They did not recover. And in August of 2017, the then management of the Bank of Ghana decided to take the first steps to clean up the banking sector. It had nothing to do with the minimum capital requirement. At the time, the minimum capital requirement was 120 million Ghana cities. These uh, two banks were, um, were closed in August 2017, as you know. And then it was later on in October of that year that the central bank, having looked at the soundness of the banking sector, decided that it was best to increase the minimum capital requirement, to raise the floor of the capital available in that industry to ensure the banks are stronger, they are able to withstand shocks and risks that they assume, and as well as be able to support the economy's growth better. Now, in August of last year, 2018, another five banks were closed, still having nothing to do with the 400 million Ghana cities, because the deadline for meeting that requirement was December 31st, 2018. So the five banks whose licenses were revoked in August 2018 were also deeply insolvent. Um, Construction Bank, which was one of the five banks, was not insolvent, but it was operating at about one-fourth of the capital that was required, the 120 million that was required. As a result of uh, suspicious uh, capital, it had um, an actually non-existent capital it had um, brought in at the point of licensing. So these banks' licenses were revoked in accordance with law. Now fast forward to December uh, 31st, 2018, when the deadline um, you know, occurred, we found out that a number of banks had complied. Actually, the great majority of banks uh, had complied, and that made us actually very, um, very happy, very hopeful about the future of the, of the industry. So like you rightly said, 23 banks have now complied with this requirement. 17, um, let's make that correction here once and for all, 17 banks um, 
have complied with this through a process of injecting more capital through, by the shareholders or um, deploying what we call income reserves, uh, reserves that they had kept out of their profits, out, out of their net profits over the years and decided to um, use to capitalize the bank. Um, so 17 of those banks um, did it that way. Now, another three banks merged. So you have Omni Bisic, you have um, First Atlantic Bank and Energy Bank, and then you have GHL Bank that has been, um, uh, if you will, acquired by FNB that had already met the requirement as well. Uh, and, and then you have these five banks that have been supported under the Ghana Amalgamated Trust. So altogether, you have uh, 23 banks have been met. Bank of Baroda, as you know, has exited by a decision of its shareholder, very strategic decision, has in, which had nothing to do with the, with the capital minimum mm -hmm. capital increase. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is the state of the banking sector uh, as of today. We start the new year on a high note of stronger banks, 23 stronger banks, well-capitalized banks, poised to support the economy going forward. Help me out here. I'm looking at the, uh, the Bank of Ghana publication highlights updates on the banking sector reforms. And it says here on the third page, 16 banks have met the new minimum paid up capital requirement, mainly through capitalization of income surplus and the fresh capital injection. Yes. It has named these 16 banks. Yes. Which, which is the 17? FNB. It says first bank F here. First national bank. Yeah, but First Bank is here. So there's Zenith, Ecobank, GCB, Stambic Bank, Standard Chartered, Barclays, Access, Consolidated, Republic, Fidelity, UBA, Societe General, GT Bank, First Bank, that's FBN Bank, which is in, in that group, uh, Cow Bank, and Bank of Africa. So the FBN, you read, you read there's First Bank of Nigeria. That's different from mm. FNB, That's first which is National, first national oh, yeah, Bank. There's the okay. in there, there's the so mm. what had happened was that we counted them as part of the mergers. Oh, okay. Which is correct, but then they had met the requirement they already. They met it on their own on before, their own, they, before took on they took GHL. on GHL. Absolutely. Okay, so this okay. major was sort of for the benefit of GHL. It was for it was in their mutual interest. Mm. Yeah. So to the question that I asked, are we at the end of the shakeup in the banking sector? We are at the end of the cleanup exercise. So when the current management of the Bank of Ghana started uh, twenty two, roughly twenty one, twenty two uh, months ago. The focus was very clear. It was to clean up the banking sector and rebuild it and reposition it to be stronger and to be able to serve this economy better. To, to do that, the cleanup had to start first. So we had to weed out banks that were gone. You know, we did not collapse these banks. These banks had collapsed and needed to go out. Um, we gave banks the opportunity to recapitalize. Those that did not recapitalize have also been closed, as you know. Uh, in the last few days. Now, the cleanup is ended in the banking sector. What we have now is not the end of the entire reform process. Mm -hmm. The reform process includes new regulatory developments, including uh, a corporate governance directive we recently reissued, fit and proper test requirement uh, that provides details of what we're going to be looking for in approving shareholders and directors and the executive management of banks. It includes uh, directives on risk management, directives on uh, financial holding companies and the activities of banks that fall within groups, uh, and, and the like. Another important part of the reform process is to transition fully to what we call the Basel II and Basel III capital framework. That is ongoing. We have just started asking banks to comply. From late last year, they were beginning to test it out. From beginning of this year, they're complying full swing. Now, these are all part, critical parts of the reform process. So we haven't just asked banks to recapitalize. We haven't just asked banks to uh, exit because they have failed. But we intend to continue to build the system so that each bank remaining is, so, is safe and sound okay. and resilient, as well as the banking sector as a whole is stronger because they're, they're complying with more stringent regulation. Our supervisory structures and processes and people are stronger than ever so that we can all begin to rebuild the confidence we need in the banking system. So the sector is still undergoing some reform Absolutely. of, of sorts. Absolutely. But are we going to see any more closure of banks' purchase and assumptions, um, mergers, 
which are uh, marriages of convenience. The good thing as we speak today is that we can confidently say that the banks, the 23 banks remaining, are all now on a solid footing. Now, regulation is a dynamic process. Our objective is to ensure that we maintain stability of the banking sector. That's an ongoing process. So every day, we're monitoring banks. Every day, we want to make sure these banks are strong and safe. If anything comes up that gives us the impression that a bank isn't strong, we will have to take action at that point. But as of today, we can say that these 23 banks are all strong, they're safe, they're on a solid footing. And we will continue to supervise them to make sure they remain that way. Mm. Uh, the question still remains outstanding as to whether or not a UT capital would, would happen again. But let's move on for the sake of time. Um, but but I, I'd like to address that. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't leave that hanging. Because okay. we, you know, part of my being here is to make sure we clarify all these important issues. W would it, would it happen today, again? Can you give the people today, of Ghana the assurance? As of today, we don't have any reason to believe that any of these banks... Uh, is, is, is not on a solid footing that would require us to do anything of that nature. But that's not to say that no bank can fail, ever. What okay. we plan to do is to ensure that with strong supervision and with making banks and their shareholders and directors and managers themselves responsible for the safety of their banks, we would begin to see a stronger banking sector. So that I can assure you. Okay. In the past, we spoke with you after the collapse of some of these other institutions, and uh, we had similar words of how we are working to make sure this does not happen in the financial sector again, and it did. So how different is this um, situation, is this time around? This is very different, Daniel. I mean, at the time of the first two banks that were whose licenses were revoked, and as of last year when we revoked the five licenses, we were very clear in our minds that at that point in time, these banks had failed and had to exit. But we were also very sure that we were embarking on a recapitalization exercise, as a result of which banks that were not able to meet it would have to exit. And okay. we kept our promise. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about some of the more recent actions that we have taken. And let me just remind listeners that this is the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. I am Daniel Dazi here with my guest, uh, Mrs. Elsie Awaji, Second Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana. We are also live on the AM show on Joy News on Multi TV. Of course, we're live on Facebook as well. Joy 99.7 FM, that's our page. And Joy News on TV, that's the Facebook page. We understand um, some private pension funds are putting uh, monies together to form the Ghana Amalgamated Trust, uh, which will be used to support, not bail out. That point has been made on a number of occasions. Support these five institutions that qualify. Which uh, private pension funds are coming together to form the trust? Um, Daniel, I think this is a question that is probably best uh, addressed to the managers of GATT and the Ministry of Finance that has uh, helped you know, to put it together. Um, as far as we're concerned, we know that there's a group of pension funds, local pension funds, that have put money together. We have verified that there are commitments to these banks. We have verified that there's money available and earmarked for these banks that's unencumbered. And that is part of the capital verification process that we, we undertook. Mm -hmm. But the details of it, because it is GATT that is actually investing in these banks, and mm -hmm. that's what our interest was. We needed to understand who was behind GATT, and we were, were, were satisfied that these are persons that we are happy to have as um, holders of, as shareholders of GATT or as investors in GATT that, through which banks would benefit. So who is behind GATT? Who has satisfied you? I think you should talk to GATT and the Ministry of Finance about it. I'm asking you. I mean, Local pension funds. Here. I think that, you know, that's, that's as far as I can tell you. Local pension funds, we have checked with the uh, NPRA, that's the regulator. These are all in good standing. They exist. They are not fly-by-night funds. They exist. The regulator has held them to be uh, in good standing. And, and that's all I can say for now. Okay. Um, the question goes unanswered, but we have to go on. It, uh, well, Daniel, let's address that. I don't want to leave here with any unanswered no, questions in your mind. The question is, who, which pension funds are they? Can you name them for there us? There are a number of pension funds behind it. I think that we would not uh, leave here today if I was going to mention all of them. So uh, I think the point, How many? the point I've made is that we can get all these details from GATT. And I think we should let that happen. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to look at the fourth um, point that has been mentioned um, in the... 
the recent statement talking about the details of GATT. Now, GATT has committed funds from pension funds, as you see, pension funds, which are a number and we are unable to name. Absolutely. Yes. Well, um, there's a, a lot of them. So I think ideally you should talk to um, GATT for a list, which you can publish to your listeners if you want. I, I'm only curious because... You mean you, you told us just a few minutes ago that you are satisfied with the persons behind GATS. Absolutely. According to the managers of GATS, well, according to the Ministry of Finance statement, GATS is local investors and pension funds. And um, we are unable to find out now what the number is. You are unable to tell us what the number is or who these pension funds are. That's just the curiosity because you have vested, we have vetted these pension funds. The, the investor in these banks is GAT. So okay. you vetted GATT? We've, we've vetted GATT and we verify that GATT has these investments mm. from these uh, funds. And we have checked that these funds exist and are in good standing. So I believe that the list will be available if you would check I want to GATT. read this part. GATT has committed funds from pension funds and other investors through a bond program with proceeds of up to 2 billion Ghana cities to be used for equity investment in the eligible indigenous banks as determined by the investors. The bonds issued to the pension funds will be listed on the Ghana Fixed Income Market, GFIM, for liquidity purposes. Are these investors different from the pension funds? So this is a statement issued by the Ministry of Finance, right? Or by GATT? Ministry of Finance. This is not the Bank of Ghana? No, this is right? not the Bank okay. of Ghana. Okay, so I'm not sure why you're asking me questions about uh, a statement issued by the Ministry of Finance. But suffice it to say that GATT is itself investor in these banks, and behind GATT are bond investors which we know to be pension funds. So I'd, I'd like to... So that's, I, I think that's you've the asked the question in many bankers, different ways, Daniel. That's the Bank of Ghana's position Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, you've, you've asked it in many different ways. I hope that... It's an important I question. Have, I have clarified the question in your how much is, um, uh, How much is each bank receiving? Oh. Mm -hmm. From GATT? Yeah, from GATT. Well, each of these banks is in a different place as far as its capital is concerned pre gat So each of them gets the amount that is required to bridge uh, the gap to 400 million. Okay? So it's not one number for everyone. Okay. okay. It's not for it's not one number for everyone. No, but every they, bank are, is in a different place. But so. there are five banks surely with five banks we can we can go through uh, the, the details now can we not? Yeah, so what are you trying to find out? The total amount of money? No, the total as given in the statement exactly. is two billion. Two billion. Absolutely. Yes. So when you divide that two billion uh, into well, five. Well, I don't have the data right in front of me, but I know that every bank is closing. For example, you have Omni and Basic. They have merged, so the gap is much smaller. I think you're talking about 120 million or so, compared to UMB or pre or uh, you know Prudential, for example, that hasn't merged. You know, neither of whom have merged, and so you're talking about a bigger gap. But all together, we're talking about two billion. Okay. Now you have oversight over the in the entire financial industry. Um, that's not correct. Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Um, that's not correct. We have oversight over banks, over specialized deposit-taking institutions, and we have oversight over certain non-bank financial institutions like leasing companies, uh, you know, uh, mortgage finance. You know, houses so that and stuff leaves, like that. That yeah. leaves pensions. It leaves pensions, it leaves insurance, it leaves uh, capital market activities. Like How the securities close firms. have we been working with the NPRA? Because um, uh, my question here is that the National Pensions Act does not allow pension funds to invest more than 5% of their funds in collective investment schemes. GATT can be named as one of those investment schemes. So in your speaking with the NPRA, how legal is GAT as an institution, since you checked GAT as an institution? Well, I will start off by saying that, you know, with, with my knowledge of finance, GATT is not a collective investment scheme. Collective investment scheme, That can scheme, be argued, of course. It's there are not. experts in the field who argue that it is. I, I would argue that it's not. A collective okay. investment scheme is a unit trust or a mutual fund or an REIT that pools small investors together to invest their funds in, in certain assets. This is not the case. This is a case of sophisticated investors, like pension funds, putting money in a vehicle to invest in banks. That's very different from what you call a collective investment scheme. Now, let me say again that the NPRA has been very much part of this arrangement, and they have given assurances that they have blessed you know, the process by which pension funds will put money in GATT and in turn GATT invest in these banks. So the commitments have been made, firm, irrevocable you know, commitments sanctioned by the NPRA. And the NPRA as regulator has taken a view 
on the state of the banking industry and the fact that GATT itself will be able, uh, will be a good vehicle uh, in which pension funds can invest for the purpose of strengthening indigenous banks. And so that I think any more questions about um, how NPRA uh, finds comfort in these arrangements are best addressed to NPRA. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, but what will be the impact on the, um, on the general securities industry as a reform, as a form, as a result of these divestments that are going to be made by these pension funds and these various investors? Have we have we considered that? You mean uh, at the back end when these yes, investors yes, yes. pull out? Yes, when I, these invest when these monies are being because these are monies that have been invested elsewhere. And we are going to oh, redirect them. Right. We are going to redirect them into the banking industry. I think it will create. I, I can see only only good things out of this. Uh, it can. It would create activity on the secondary market if these invest. If these pension funds are invested in, say, stock market instruments, for example, uh, then they would be selling these instruments. And I would believe that, you know, it will create activity on the secondary market. You know, it, it would provide opportunities for liquidity on the secondary market, and I think that's good. Mm. Uh, our guest this morning is Mrs. Elsie Awaji. She's the second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, and she is. You know, we are going through exactly what has been happening with the banking sector in the past few months, really, and um, drilling down to exactly what is happening today. We've been spending a little time talking about the Ghana Amalgamated Trust and the banks that are being bailed out as a result. And we'll take these important messages. When we come back, we'll look at the criteria. I know um, a lot has been said in the publications made by the Bank of Ghana, but she'll take us to the criteria for selecting these specific five banks which uh, are going to be supported by G80. And then we'll look at, you know, at the other sectors of the financial industry that the Bank, can, the, the Bank of Ghana looks at and what is coming there as well. It's a super morning show. I am Daniel Dazi. Stay with us. I wake up in the morning, it's a new day. And I got bills that I have to pay. Now you're running late, running out of time. Feels like the world is waiting in line. All you gotta do is pick up the phone and just die. Seven, three, seven. So whatever you do. See, I don't need to write or cash a check. I don't need data or internet. I have something that's faster than a jet. Just like... Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? You could be a farm wine supper, a teacher, a rapper, a schoolboy, a school girl, or a trader, a bank MD, a chairman, or a baker. Guaranteed Trust Bank. Wouldn't you rather bank with us? Hello? I say, I want to know why. Vodafone normal 10 megabyte free data. It will call Smart Kruby Adwin. Share. Hello? Have you heard that Vodafone is giving 10 megabyte free data for every minute you talk? You just down 50 50. Yeah, hello? Aha! Uh -huh. Right now, we the Vodafone people just the call, call plenty. Sick of us, you talk one minute, you go get 10 megabytes. You talk two minutes, you go get 20 megabytes. Three minutes. Call Vodafone or any network and get 10 megabytes of free data every minute you talk. It's simple. Talk to browse. The more you talk, the more data you get. Dial 5050 to subscribe. Talk more, browse more. Terms and conditions apply. The future is exciting. Ready? Would you buy a blade that doesn't cut? How about a freezer that doesn't cool enough to freeze? And what of medicine that wouldn't cure you or take your pain away? No way! So why would you buy a mattress that does not provide you with good quality sleep and rest? As humans, we spend about a third of our lives in bed. Since you are going to spend that much time, wouldn't you rather be lying on a mattress that is clean and just right for your body? Be smart. Treat yourself well. Don't spend one third of your life sleeping on the wrong mattress. Or else, you do it to yourself. Latest foe, your partner for life. <laughs> Thank you. 
Nationwide Medical Insurance, the leader in private health insurance, has deployed superior technology to make your healthcare experience more convenient and exciting. With the Nationwide mobile app, you can order your prescription drugs and we will deliver to your doorsteps. With over 600 dependable healthcare service providers, you're just a step away locating your service provider of choice and accessing hospital claim information in real time. Our corporate clients are guaranteed timely corporate utilization reports. We provide on-site clinics to give employees access to health care in the comfort of their offices. Enjoy these amazing benefits and so much more by signing on to Nationwide Medical Insurance today. Call us on toll-free number 0800-222222 or visit our website www.nationwidemh.com. Nationwide Medical Insurance. Join the healthcare family. Daddy Lumbe Sika Sem in the background. We are talking about money this morning. Your money. Do you keep money in the bank or under your pillow? <laughs> if you keep your money under your pillow, I'll come and visit you. But this is the Super Morning Show. My name is Daniel Dazi. We are live on the AM Show on Joy News and Multi TV. Our guest this morning is Mrs. Elsie Awaji. She is second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. Taking us through the reforms in the banking sector. Mrs. Awaji has assured us that all the banks that are currently existing, the 23, are on solid footing. As far as the reforms so far are concerned, we won't see any more um, closures and what have you. But of course, that depends on the governance and the management of the banks themselves going forward. But at this point, you're on a solid footing. We're going to peruse some of these banks and look at exactly how solid that footing is, but how some of these decisions um, were, were, uh, came about. But Afrodan is offering you today the most comfortable chair in the world, the Nightingale Extreme Comfort Chair. It has over 10 thoughts fully engineered features, especially customized for your health and comfort. Working has never had it this good. So go to Afrodan on the first floor of the Swansea Shopping Arcade and feel the chair. You'll be amazed. Now, if you're a real super football fan, this is your chance to see your favorite teams go head-to-head -head live in their home stadium in the UK. Open a Barclays Ultimate account. Maintain a balance of at least 500 Ghana cities. Swipe to make payments with your Barclays card. As often as you can to win an all-expenses-paid trip to the UK to watch your favorite teams go head-to-head -head live. You could also win a stadium experience in our local super fan penthouse and take away exciting home items and your favorite team souvenirs. Don't miss out on your chance to experience football the way it was meant to be experienced live with Barclays. Visit our Facebook and Twitter for more information. Terms and conditions apply. Barclays, part of the ABSA family. <laughs> It's a super duper deal in the Malcolm Best Buy promotion. Enjoy amazing cracking deals on selected supermarket products such as Don Simon, Heinz Baked Beans, and many others. A Malcolm Best Buy promotion, super duper deals always. And remember, terms and conditions apply. Malcolm wear Ghana shops. It's nine minutes past eight. Let's get back to talking with Mrs. Elsie Awaji. Uh, thanks again for your time this morning. Uh, so we. Yes, so she's Mrs. Elsie Ado Awaji. Um, thanks again for your time um, joining us this morning. Uh, so, Mrs. Awaji, Mrs. Ado Awaji, <laughs> it's, it, they go together, yeah, forgive me. Let's talk about GN Bank. GN Bank was downgraded to a savings and loans institution. Um, well, they submitted their banking, their universal banking license, and they have decided to be um, uh, savings and loans. Institution, but five other banks were saved through GAT. So, why not GN Bank? Why was why did they not go through that process? Well, let me start, Daniel, by explaining that GN Bank's license, banking license, was reclassified as a savings and loan institution. Okay. It's very important to maintain that. Reclassified. Uh, it, it was reclassified. Mm. It already had a license, and it was surrendered it for another license. Mm -hmm. So the the issue of downgrade doesn't come in because every institution is important. Every category 
every tier. Okay, so you don't you don't see it as a downgrade. It's not a downgrade. Okay. It's a it's a it's a reclassification. That's fine. Okay, that's that's fine. That, that's, that's let's, let's stick with that. Um, no, secondly, is that the five banks uh, benefiting from GATT include two state-owned banks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, NIB and ADB. Mm-hmm. So those are the responsibilities of government, uh, and government somehow has had an arrangement with GATT by which these banks have been recapitalized. Um, the three other banks uh, were chosen by GATT on the basis of solvency and good governance. So those were the criteria that GATT in the engagement with us as regulators they were very clear that they were only going to put money in private banks that were one solvent and two had made efforts to try to raise the additional capital uh, but also uh, and, and for market reasons, had not been able to raise them. And three, these banks were well-governed and well-managed. So this is a criteria that was that we didn't choose those banks for them. They chose their banks, and uh, they decided who they were going to invest in. Also banks that give comfort to the pension funds that were behind GATT. So that's all I can say on that. Uh, uh, we, we, we've been very clear uh, in our discussions with them that these are not... We, we were not going to offer any banks to them. We had a criteria. Uh, we had a requirement for the whole industry, and we were going to ensure that everyone met it. Mm. And that's all that we did. Mm. Yeah. From where you sit, away from what, what informed people's decisions, from where you sit, is GN well-governed and solvent? Well, GN, like we said, we have given it a new license, right? We, we have approved a new license for it. And so uh, on, on that basis, we're sure that it will continue to survive. It will continue to do well. Uh, we have said also in our press release that we've appointed an advisor for GN Bank to ensure that the transition from banks back to savings and loans is done smoothly and that it does it in a way that makes it sustainable. So, of course, we're going to be keeping very close uh, tabs on GN Bank, making sure that they're transitioning right and are sustainable. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, it's the opinion of some, of course, uh, I don't know whether or not the bank agrees, but it's the opinion of some, obviously, that they do not, they are not as well governed and as solvent as, for instance, Omni and BSIC. Well, I, w- I mean, we're not GATT. <laughs> bank of Ghana is not Which is GATT. why I was asking that from we where you sit, made, what is the... Like I said, you know, the, you know, the decision in terms of which banks GATT was going to invest in was purely on the basis of GATT's own assessment and the assessment of its investors. And we had nothing to do with that. As regulators, we could not have been part of that discussion in terms of who's going to be picked. Mm. We just wanted to make sure everyone that existed from uh, the date on which we made the announcement you know, had met the requirement, and, and that's all we're mm. interested in, yes. Mm. Now, let's talk about some other um, sectors of the financial industry now that you still have oversight over. Now, you have about 566 licensed microfinance institutions. In 2018, 211 are active but distressed and folded up. That's 37 percent. Also, out of a total of 141 rural and community banks, 37, that's about a quarter, are active but distressed or folded up in total. It's estimated that 272 out of the 707 institutions in the subsector, representing 38.5%, are at risk. This indicates that approximately 740.5 million Ghana cities is owed to an estimated 705,396 deposits of the distressed or folded ups folded up uh, microfinance institutions or rural community banks. So in terms of the significance, these deposits under distress form 8.81% and 52.49% of industry total deposits of commercial uh, rural banks and microfinance institutions respectively, 52% of microfinance institutions. This is according to the Bank of Ghana's 2018 report. So we've, you've talked about the banking, the main banking sector. What about these sectors? Well, I think we've always said that uh, after the banking sector cleanup, we were going to turn our focus on the what we call the SDI sector, which is the specialized deposit-taking institution sector. The, these include the savings and loans, finance houses, microfinance, and rural and community banks. Uh, now that we can say that we're done with the banking sector cleanup, our approach now is to uh, dig deeper into these sectors and understand where things are. Now, the data changes every day. Mm-hmm. You know, some of these institutions have been on a recovery path. 
Um, and so it's important that we take stock again in terms of where these are. You know, some of them have been recapitalized. Uh, since, since the report was uh, put Absolutely. Okay, and so th this is a constant process where uh, we, we closely monitor. And like I said, now that we're done with the banking sector cleanup, we're turning our focus to these institutions, assess where they are and which ones uh, can stay and which ones um, will be dealt with. Mm. So by, by dealt with, you mean some may, be, may have to be closed down? It, it depends on mm. where they are. It depends on where they are. We expect all financial institutions to meet the regulatory requirements. If they, if they do not meet it and they'd be given an opportunity to, re, you know, to redress uh, and, and, and they continue to lag behind, then appropriate action should be taken in the interest of depositors and in the interest of, of the stability of the entire system. Mm. So this is a, an ongoing process. Mm. A, a few questions uh, before we, we step out of the studio now. Is the Consolidated Bank out of the liquidity issues yet? We understand that even though there was a $9 billion bailout, um, some customers found it, it, it difficult accessing their funds. Some even alleged, of course, these are allegations that the nine billion never got to um, those banks. Um, can you throw some more light on that? I'm not sure where the nine billion is coming from, but you know, Con Consolidated Bank had taken over five banks um, as of August 2017. And for that, a bond of 7.6 billion was issued to it by the Ministry of Finance on behalf of government. So the 7.6 billion is the asset that it got right from government to mm -hmm. support, uh, you know, operating the accounts that were transferred to it. Out of that, 3.2 billion of that bond was monetized by the Bank of Ghana to provide liquidity to CBG because the bond is a good asset. However, it pays coupons twice a year. And then you have to wait for maturity, you know, to get the principal. So we monetize that, meaning we bought that. We bought a portion of the bond to provide upfront liquidity to CBG. Now, what people need to understand is that after I took over those banks and those deposits, although money had been given to it to pay out as and when depositors needed their money, um, you also have to understand that there's a process by which claims have to be verified and validated. And some of that took a long time because of the state of records uh, at those banks that it had taken over. Mm -hmm. You know, the examples of some of those banks that had commingled banking accounts with capital market accounts, investment accounts. And so a customer would come up to CBG and say, here's my receipt. I, I have money, uh, you know, a deposit with this, with the bank, with the s bank. And it would turn out after verification that that deposit did not exist at all or that it was rather a claim on the investment wing of the group and not the bank. So that took a while. And, and all of this was done in a very transparent manner. Customers were constantly informed and updated by CBG. So that, that took a while to verify. And uh, there were all sorts of related record keeping, verification processes that delayed payments uh, for a while. But I, I can say f uh, for sure today that CBG is well capitalized, well li it's, it's liquid. It's got a good asset on its uh, books, it's solvent, it's liquid, and it's doing business. It's actually getting in new deposits every day. And just j just for a quick point of clarification, the, the figure nine billion was announced by Mr. Kufalu, the, the, the president, and he mentioned how the debts within the, the whole within the banking sector has increased, and that's what we're referring to. But right, but yeah. I'll mm -hmm. correct that. So you're talking probably about seven point six for CBG and two point two for Ghana Commercial Bank that had acquired mm, mm, mm. the deposits of Capital Bank and UT Bank. Mm, so mm, altogether, mm. you're talking about 9.8 9 billion. 9 .8 billion or mm, something like mm, that. Okay. Mm, mm. okay. Um, speaking of CBG, one of the banks joining being um, Heritage Bank, um, the board of, let me say, the former Heritage Bank um, has released a statement. Um, I'm going to read just a, a bit of it. We would have preferred not to enter into any public disputation about these matters with the central bank so as not to further darken the cloud that hangs over the ongoing banking reforms. However, we owe it due to, our, to ourselves, our cherished customers, our dedicated staff, um, who in the face of challenges remain committed to the vision of the bank. Okay. Um, it says that they want to clarify certain claims in the press release by the Bank of Ghana that are either complete falsehoods or inaccurate at best. And they go on 
to name a number of them suspicious source of capital and related matters, grounds for revocation of HBL's license, and a number of others. They say your statement contains clear falsehoods. Well, that's their view. And our view is that we're standing, we're standing on solid facts and law. Mm. And uh, that's where I'll, I'll, I'll leave this matter. Yeah, I mean, because it's, it's names, just the first one, the suspicious source of capital and related matters, as part of its due diligence ahead of granting of HBL's provisional banking license, um, it had requested and received confirmation from CocoBot of the existence of the contractual arrangement between CocoBot and the said shareholder. Daniel, we've examined all the records available to us, internal and external, and everything we said is backed by the facts available to us. Okay. Does that then mean that these checks may have happened, but the licenses were issued, the license was issued, we have nevertheless? Done, we have verified the facts and the records available to us, and we're standing on firm ground when we say the things we've said in our press release. Okay. What do you say to um, persons, and it's not just Heritage Bank former board members who say this, but almost all the banks that have gone under. We find persons within saying that, look, they are being targeted. The Bank of Ghana is being selective. Since you are here, let's clarify that. Are you, are you being selective? What, what would be the basis of that allegation, of that claim? I mean, we have... Heritage, for instance, has named uh, something saying that you are, you are stating falsehood, which you dispute, of course, but that's I their do, position. I did dispute that. Mm -hmm. and, and people are well within their rights to dispute actions of the central bank and dispute facts. In the end, there are processes, you know, for confirming who's right and who's wrong. And I would, we would encourage people to pursue those. But we have acted based on information available to us. We have used the same law. We have used facts available to us, which we have cross-checked which we have investigated and confirmed, based on which we've taken action. Mm. And based on that, it will be very difficult for anybody to show that we have been selective or we haven't applied the law uh, fairly. I mean, one of our greatest responsibilities as a regulator is to be fair, but also to be firm. Also to be firm. Of course. And we're, we're committed to the rule of law, just as we, we want to act within the confines of the law, we expect everybody else to operate within the confines of the law. And mm. that we will make sure. Of course. A and some of these people, like you said, some have chosen to challenge. Some of these people have um, gone to court challenging the decisions made by the Bank of Ghana. Is this affecting your work in any way? Not at all. Not at all. People, uh, aggrieved persons are well within their rights to go to court or go to, to any other mechanism available by law you know to pursue their case or to or to challenge actions you know that's that's well within their law i mean their rights we like i say act based on law in fact and whenever we've been hauled before the court we have gone to tell our story I like the way you say hold before the well, court. <laughs> now, um, the, the other for leg... For lack of a better word. <laughs> the other leg of this discussion has been that... And, and it's, it has been stated, for instance, in uh, parts, reports that we have seen commissioned by the, uh, by, by the central bank that there was forbearance on the parts of the regulator being the Bank of Ghana. The Bank of Ghana in the past re uh, reportedly transferred some nine directors after the collapse of some of these earlier banks. Let's start with these nine. Has any further action been taken against them? But where is this coming from? Where is this idea that nine persons were, that were transferred because of earlier actions? This was confirmed by Mr. Osesi, Jesse, the, head of the, the current head of the Banking Supervision Division when he was sitting in the chair yeah, occupying now. Well, we've had transfers within the bank, but I'm not sure anyone has linked them to anything in particular. I mean, as part of our ongoing strengthening of the bank, of the Bank of Ghana, we would move people around. You know, we were, we're always assessing, you know, strengths and, and competencies and needs of the bank. And as a routine matter, we will move people around. Everybody who joins the Bank of Ghana knows that they're not assured of one department. Uh, and so let's leave that matter. So there. these transfers but have nothing have to said, do with we what's happening said, in the banking sector? We have said time and again that we have instituted an internal investigation process. That process is still ongoing. We've set up a whole unit, uh, a whole office for that, an independent office to investigate what may or may not have happened that led to the failures of these banks. And we have given assurance to the public, which we stand by, that anybody who's found 
to have been complicit uh, will not be spared. We would exercise all the administrative powers available to us uh, to, you know, to bring them to book. Meanwhile, we have also passed on every information we have about these cases to the appropriate state uh, agencies, law enforcement agencies, and if they find that any any persons uh, currently uh, working at the bank or previously working at the bank were also complicit, they also have the processes that they're entitled to follow. But we, as management, have put in place a mechanism. That process is still ongoing, and we're getting regular updates. We want to see that it's an independent process. We will not be involved in, 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 in micromanaging it at, at the point at which it's final. You know, options will be clear to us. So there are BOG officials who are currently being investigated by state institutions it, like it, Ioko? It would appear. So Ioko and others that are involved in investigating everything that <coughs> may have occurred with the failure of those banks mm -hmm. have free have, have the free you know, reign to call in anybody uh, who may have had anything to do with these banks, including officials at the Bank of Ghana. From what you know, have these officials been called? Um, may, well, I don't know. It's an ongoing process. So it may be that some of them have been called. Um, I know that a good number of people have been called. From the BOG? Um, I'm not sure about current staff, but I know that... Former staff of the BOG? Well, yes, absolutely. And it's well within the investigating everything that could have gone wrong with these issues. I ask this question so. because in cases like this, we find that officials are asked to step aside from their current duties right. so that they do not um, tamper with the investigations that are ongoing. Because I can imagine that Yoko would have to look in the current books of the BOG. Um, no such persons have been asked to step aside. No such persons have been found who could be culpable. It's an ongoing process, like I keep saying. And the what our internal investigations process is, is totally independent. So no one is able to influence it. I mean, well, yeah, but that's an administrative process. I'm talking absolutely. about mm, yeah, I'm talking about the the criminal investigations and the the possible culpability of persons who could be innocent. Yes, but yes. that process is ongoing too. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not aware that anybody within the Bank of Ghana has been asked to step aside by Ioko or any state agency okay. because they're conducting an investigation. They have full access. Ioko and anybody else investigating this has full access to all the records, whether or not anybody is is an is at post or not. Mm. A, a quick one on and the issue of Heritage Bank. Um, the BOGs claim that the court had requested um, disclosures from Heritage Bank. Um, th that claim was made. Now Heritage counters that they are not party to the Cocoa Board deal, so. Um, they ask why would the courts demand disclosures from them? Well, the court, as you know, has power to subpoena anyone, you know, to provide information. You don't have to be a party to, to a suit. But mm -hmm. again, that's a process that is ongoing. Uh, we have everything we've said is backed by facts and law. So mm. that's where I'll leave mm. it. Mm. Okay. Um, and I just got... <laughs> As we speak now, even though we had planned to ask this one, I just got another this question coming in again for about uh, the fourth or fifth time. It's, it's a matter of great concern. Former workers of the collapsed banks, especially of UT and Capital, are demanding payments. Are you able to say when are they going to be paid? Daniel, you know, you know that when institutions collapse mm -hmm. through uh, a process that you know, built up over time, right? In the case of UTN and Capital Bank, these were insolvent institutions. They yeah. had failed. Yeah. They were made to exit. Now, you would find that because it wasn't a voluntary exit, it wasn't as though the banks themselves were doing a merger or an acquisition. Because these banks even disputed that they were insolvent. They well, no. that's a matter for them to prove. Yeah. But, but then, you know, these banks hadn't entered into a negotiation with staff to say, here's what we're paying you. So yeah. staff, actually, if there are any unpaid... Uh, salaries before these banks exited, um, they become claims on the books of the receiver, and those have to be paid in accordance with a hierarchy that's established by law, a list of priorities. Employees fall, I think, about the, on, in the fifth position the fifth, or something like that. Five, right? yes. So that process has to be ongoing. Recoveries have to be made in court, uh, if any, and then based on the hierarchy of claims, these persons are paid. So that's the process ongoing. Now, given a lot of the, of the petitions that have come up, okay, the government um, speaking in, in, in conjunction with the Bank of Ghana um, have looked into how can these persons be helped. Mm -hmm. 
okay? And the Bank of Ghana has decided on purely humanitarian grounds, purely humanitarian grounds, that what was owed to it by virtue of liquidity support that it had given to these banks, which ranks very high in the hierarchy of claims, um, what should have come to the BOG, okay, should be used in part to pay off some of those claims for the two banks. Because, UTN capital. Yes, because mm -hmm. some 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 recoveries are coming. Okay. Which BOG is entitled to by virtue of liquidity support it provided to those banks that remained unpaid. Uh, but purely out of humanitarian grounds, the Bank of Ghana has decided that we would allow you to take part of our money uh, to alleviate you know, the hardship uh, of these former employees uh, because we really care about them. Too. And, and liquidity you know, support is number two on the list. Yes. Yes. So that means that after uh, the first, like they are now the first being the recovery, the you know, first being the, the, recovery the, cost and the, the cost of receivership, right? Um, so after the cost of receivership, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, ELA claims, liquidity support claims, owed to the Bank of Ghana. But like I'm saying, okay. Bank of Ghana has decided that it would allow on humanitarian former em yes, former employees of those two banks to take a portion of what it would have been entitled to. So that process is ongoing. You know, uh, severance packages have been agreed with these persons, with their unions and all of that. And, and, and we've given approval for uh, recovery monies to be used, you know, to pay them. So that process, it's an administrative process that will mm. play out. And very quickly, we hope that they get paid. How quickly? How soon is well, the money going it's, to Well, uh, it's now the level of the receiver and their banks and all of that. So that process would, would, mm. would, uh, would play Within out. the first six months of the year? Hopefully, yes. Within the first six months Absolutely. of the year? Yes. Right. Um, oh, Mrs. Elsie. But, but I think we, mm -hmm. we all have to understand that we have done this uh, out of step, but also for a very good reason of wanting you know, to support these former employees. Will this extend, you mentioned UTN Capital specifically, will this extend to employees of any other banks? It, it depends, because the five banks that were closed last year um, have a recovery process in, in, in court that hasn't gone far, Okay. right? So it really depends on what's recovered, Okay. if any. Okay. Right. Yes, Mrs. Elsie Adwawaji is our guest this morning. We are wrapping up, but Mrs. Adwawaji, there's a there's a demonstration currently ongoing in Kumasi. Uh, former customers, disgruntled customers of Men's Gold, uh, who have hit the streets demanding their monies. Yeah, the Bank of Ghana is aware of this. Uh, what is happening? We, I have no idea what's happening. I'm mm. sorry. Uh, Bank of Ghana has been very clear uh, for a long while about the fact that this was an unlicensed operation. We were not responsible for it. We tried. We warned the public uh, at different points in time. We told everybody if they continue to keep their money there, they did that at their own risk. And that's all I can say about it. But it's still within the powers of the bank to move in and close an institution that is holding itself as a financial institution and is not regulated, is it not? Well, we, we had started the process of uh, consultation, close consultation with other stakeholders which we had wanted to work with. Uh, you don't just get up and close an institution. You need to understand what's there. What are they holding? Who's deposits? What, in what amounts? How are they invested? If you close them, where can you find it so people mm -hmm. can get? And so that process, it takes, while, it takes a while. And with, with Men's Gold, we had no, no visibility at all in terms of what was going on there. So it was a process to unravel the mystery behind it and, and then at some point to act. But we were working in close consultation with other agencies. And, of, of course, it was um, closed down by the action of one of our sister regulators. And um, so that's what it is. But we had warned the public that they were at risk. So now the public is on their own? As far as we're concerned, we had issued enough warning. And I think that we had done our work. We're being told that on humanitarian grounds as well, we should consider um, the, the amount of money is lodged. We, we don't even know this. how much money you're talking about. We have zero visibility on that. And we, have, we, we did our work by consistently advising the public. You're yeah, being called so. um, insensitive. And not you, I mean government. is being called insensitive or well, wicked uh, as a result. I, I speak for the Bank of Ghana. Mm -hmm. so, uh, well, this is part of government. Uh, it's part of the it's, state. It's a state institution. Yes. And uh, I have told you what we did about it. So. Mrs. Elsie Adwawaji is was our guest this morning. It's 26 minutes to the top of the hour here on the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM. We are done, but she has a few final words to say. Thank you, Daniel. Um, it's been a great um, time with you. I hope that 
All of your questions are answered, and the questions on the minds of your listeners have been clarified. But I just want to add by saying that at this point in time, we have 23 strong banks. We have come a long way. It's been a painful 22 months or so. And we can say, we can all say that we have achieved, you know, the objectives for which we set out to clean up the banking sector. Going forward, we're rebuilding the industry with stronger regulation, with stronger supervision. On our part, we're reforming our systems, our processes, and our people uh, to ensure that we can be more effective supervisors. We're putting in place uh, safeguards like a deposit insurance scheme so that from the third quarter of this year, your deposits are all protected without risk to, without a risk to the taxpayer if a bank were to fail. And I must add that um, one of the things that we're doing as well together with other regulators in the financial system, okay. and, and this is through the, the, uh, the wisdom of the president, His Excellency the President of Ghana, is that we're, we're now part of what, what is called the Financial Stability Council which has just been recently established. Mm -hmm. And the objective of this council is that the Bank of Ghana, the NIC, the NPRA, the SEC, should not only be concerned about the segments of the financial system. While each of us should regulate and supervise these uh, subsectors very well, we also need to work together and think through what we call systemic issues, issues that affect all of these subsectors, so mm -hmm. that together, we can all build a resilient financial system. And we're very happy to be part of this initiative. Okay. Uh, we're encouraging all depositors to be reassured that their deposits are safe in these banks. The two banks that were closed on Friday um, have their deposits transferred already to CVG. Over this long weekend, this past long weekend, mm. all the accounts were, oh, really? were migrated to CVG. Really? And as of 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. this afternoon, depositors of Heritage Bank and Premium Bank um, can access their deposits through CBG at any CBG branch. What, what about the merged institutions, the institutions that are merging? They, what is their status? They, they still, the customers will still continue to access the account at their banks. Okay. It takes a few months for all of the integration to happen. So we're monitoring all of those. By which well. time are you expecting that um, the integration, you know, software and all of that? Well, we think happen? in the next couple of months or so, right? For, for so GN, by March? For, for GN Bank, because it's a little bit more uh, complex in terms of uh, exiting from some of the lines of business, mm -hmm. which a savings and loans cannot mm -hmm. operate in, we've given them up to June. Okay. Right. Uh, but for the two banks, uh, the two banks whose licenses were pulled on Friday, Heritage Bank and Premium Bank, uh, their customers can, as of 2 p.m. today, access the deposits from any of the CBG branches around the country. Now, Not these, just the branches that they used to bank with. They've, they've been migrated into, nice. uh, you know, just to make the process a little bit more okay. uh, streamlined. And, and these deposits are safe, and so they need not rush to go get their money. If mm -hmm. they need them, of course, it will be available uh, mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. okay? So on that note, I just want to, again, wish your listeners a very happy mm -hmm. and outstanding 2019. And uh, we count on everybody's the support. The reigning here is super, super. Super, super, super good 2019. Mm -hmm. And we count on the on the support of all stakeholders as we together build a more resilient financial system. Yes. And, and just because I've, I've been asked this question so many times, personally, no intervention from the Bank of Ghana on men's gold. You're quite persistent, aren't you? <laughs> no, it, it, I'm being just as persistent as people we, have we been We don't even me. have the power to intervene. We, I mean, we, we don't, we didn't regulate it. There's no way we're going to give it anything. We, we don't have anything to do with men's gold, unfortunately. Okay. Unfortunately. So no intervention. Nothing. Elsie Adwawaji, Second Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana. We are very grateful that you joined us this morning. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. All right. This is still the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM.